Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. Uh, today, we continue our special coverage, Aspiring Intellectuals, where we have even longer and harder conversations on foundational topics with our guests from quantum computing to bioengineering, from environmental ethics to human psychology. And today I'm so excited uh, to interview Sheldon Solomon. He is a professor of psychology at Skidmore College. He is best known for developing terror management theory along with Jeff Greenberg and Tom Pazeski, uh, which is concerned with how humans deal with their own sense of mortality. He studies the effects of the uniquely human awareness of death on human behaviors, and he is co-author of several, several books, including this one that we will uh, be discussing today, The Warm at the Core on the Role of Death in Life. Uh, I was initially drawn to Professor Solomon's work because I listened to a three hour long podcast interview between him and Lex Friedman. And I have to say it was the single most enlightening podcast I had listened to on the Lex Friedman show uh, without exaggeration. And that was a, a few months ago during a time I was personally very confused and stressed. I was working nonstop every day and deciding between whether to go to grad school for economics or go into the real world to uh, work for a few years before reassessing my options. So Professor Solomon's ideas from taking a deep leap, leap in a faith in life to confronting the possibility of death uh, were just truly profound and really changed a lot of my thinking back then. So Professor Solomon, that was my very long introduction uh, for, for you. I hope I didn't take too much time out, out of our precious uh, slot, but uh, I, I just wanna say thank you so much for joining me today on Policy Punchline and also uh, for doing that amazing interview with Lex Friedman. Uh, my pleasure, Tiger. Uh, it's uh, just great to be here. So I, I appreciate your enthusiasm <laughs> and look forward to exchanging ideas. But maybe we should dive right in, especially about this book, uh, The Warm at the Core on the Role of Death in Life, in which uh, you really um, explored a wide range of ideas especially centered around human behaviors on what drives us, what drives many of our decisions. And, and you are a psychologist and you conducted so many interesting experiments that, that you talked about in this book. So maybe a very overview question would be, could you tell us what you seek to write about in this book? Yeah, sure. That's a great way to start, I think, Tiger. So just the, just the title of the book, The Worm at the Core, uh, we got that phrase from William James, the great philosopher, and he wrote the first psychology book, Principles of Psychology. And, and uh, James, in the varieties of religious experience, he called the worm at the core. That was his description of um, that humankind's reaction uh, to the realization that we will all die someday. And he's referring, uh, when he talks about the core, he's actually referring to the core of the apple in the Garden of Eden with the tree of knowledge. So remember those of us that uh, grew up in this tradition, everything was going well uh, back in the day uh, until Eve took a bite out of the apple and gave it to Adam and uh, everything went downhill from there. And uh, our view is that uh, what the story of Genesis, it's a beautiful allegorical tale of the evolution of consciousness. It's not so much uh, that biting the apple brought death into the world, so much as that it brought our awareness of it. Uh, and my interest in this started when, when I was your age and I read a short story of, by an a guy named Alexander Smith. It was an essay. Scottish dude in 1860s. And there's a line in it, it is our knowledge that we have to die that makes us human. And I was like, oh, damn, in my gut, I didn't like that, but I thought he might be onto something. And then I bumped into uh, Ernest Becker, who we were talking about before we got started, cultural anthropologist who wrote a book uh, in 1974 the, or, or 73, uh, The Denial of Death. Uh, and he won a Pulitzer Prize for that book, um, and in which he just takes that idea, it is our knowledge that we have to die that makes us human, and he elaborates it, uh, uh, elaborates upon it in ways that I find poignantly profound. Uh, and in, in a nutshell, Becker just says, look, if we want to understand uh, the motivational underpinnings of human behavior, why do people do what they do? Uh, then we have to heed or pay attention to our similarities with all other creatures as well as our differences. So he goes Darwin 
uh, living things are not that much different uh, than people, all of them, uh, because all living things want to survive. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, there's lots of different ways to survive. You could get the giraffe with the big neck and the eagles flying with good eyesight. And so what do we have? Well, we've got some handy physical attributes, of course, upright bipedalism, opposable thumb, stereoscopic binocular vision. But what we really got is the jumbo forebrain that enables us to think abstractly and symbolically to the point where only human beings can imagine something that doesn't exist and then take their dreams and render them tangible. This is quite handy uh, for staying alive and, and prospering. Uh, you know, all other creatures have to accept the world in the form in which they encounter it. Only humans can radically alter their surroundings in accord with their desires, All right? So that's awesome. Uh, and Becker's like, yeah, hold that thought. But now we got to go back to Kierkegaard, the existential philosopher who pointed out that, you know what, one of the unintended consequences uh, of our vast intelligence is that we realize that we're here. And, and you know, for some, that just seems banal. Oh, I'm here. I, I know that. Yeah, but Kierkegaard's like, yeah, well, a, a rose bush is here, but doesn't know it. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, an elephant's here, but doesn't know it. His point was that you need to have a very sophisticated cognitive apparatus to make yourself the object of your own subjective inquiry. And only people can do that. And because we know that we're here, Kierkegaard said, that's both awesome and dreadful. All right, let's get to the good news. The, and let's not forget this for one second. Kierkegaard said it is awesome to be alive and to know it, and that the ultimate privilege and joy uh, of being a human being is that uh, you get to, you have the fantastic opportunity to exist. Yeah, but so does a turtle, but you know that you exist. And in our finest moments, I would submit uh, we're just sublimely appreciative of the fact that we're here as we wallow in sp spontaneous exuberance at, at the prospect of being alive. And, and I, I hope even in the midst of a pandemic that every one of us can think back, you know, with great joy on those moments. And they're not necessarily the ones uh, that our culture would prescribe as highlights. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, it's a great moment if I win a Nobel Prize or an Olympic medal, but sometimes it's a great moment when you wake up and you catch a face full of fresh air, or, or maybe you're not feeling great and you're walking and you see somebody and they give you like that little nod just to acknowledge your existence. Uh, and you, you recognize, according to Kierkegaard, and I would concur here, just that life is great, all right? But there's a downside and Kierkegaard calls it dread. And his point is very simple. If you're smart enough to know that you're here, unless you're a child or an idiot, you're also smart enough to know that like all living things, your life is a finite duration and there's someday you won't be here. And that discomfort, and by the way, the Becker's argument is that the, the realization of the inevitability of death, which was an unintended byproduct of our vast intelligence, that's the most significant event in the history of our species, and everything has changed thereafter. But it's not only that we're going to die, you also know that you can walk outside and, and get smote by a meteor or, or catch the virus. Uh, and so it, it's, I know I'm going to die. I know I'm perpetually vulnerable to being summarily obliterated. And then just to knee us in the groin, Becker goes with the Freud point that we really resent that we're embodied animals, breathing pieces of defecating meat, no more significant or enduring than lizards or potatoes. All right, so for Becker, if that's all you thought about, which by the way, I wouldn't wanna be on the side of the debating team to have to argue against, I'm gonna die. I can die at any time, and I'm a cold cut uh, with an attitude, spam with a plan, but I've got no cam. I wouldn't be able to stand up in the morning. You know, I'd literally be a twitching blob of biological protoplasm cowering under my bed, groping uh, for a large sedative. Well, but most of us are able 
to stand up in the morning, Mas Hermanos. Uh, and the reason Becker submits, uh, as you know, is because we construct and embrace what he calls cultural worldviews. Uh, as a cultural anthropologist, uh, he believes, not surprisingly, that culture is supremely important. And he says what we do quite cleverly, albeit quite unconsciously, is to collectively embrace uh, humanly constructed beliefs about reality that we share with others in our group, and uh, that the, a primary function of those beliefs is to reduce death anxiety by giving us a sense uh, that life has meaning and that we have value. And, and Becker says, if you feel like you're a valuable person in a meaningful universe, he calls that self-esteem, not to be confused or conflated with narcissism. And his point very simply is that because, uh, uh, because our, our efforts to ward off death anxiety are, are so intense and so ongoing, whether we're aware of it or not, for most of our waking moments, a good deal of what we do is in the service of maintaining confidence in our worldview and faith in our value as individuals. So it's in that sense uh, that uh, death is always kind of lurking in the background uh, and at the center uh, of human affairs, whether we know it or not. Professor Solomon, there's so much to unpack there, but I guess to just to quickly recap, uh, as you wrote in the introduction of your book, terror is this sort of natural and generally adaptive response to the imminent threat of death. But the tragic part of human condition is that only we humans, due to our enlarged and sophisticated neocortex, our brain, were able to experience this terror in the absence of looming danger. So we can think about the possibility of death and so on. And, and even that feeling itself could uh, confront us or could compel us to uh, adopt certain actions and um, such as adopting certain what you call as cultural worldviews, religion and so on, narratives that uh, hold ourselves together and, and, and manage that terror. And, and you mentioned um, this, this idea of you have to confront the feeling that there's imminent possibility that you may die. And, and I think that might be the most uh, visceral during the COVID-19 pandemic. I remember last March when Princeton, all the schools were announcing to shut down, we were sent home. I guess that was the really the actual moment when students around me were feeling, oh, this is a pandemic and there's a chance we might catch this. And back then we didn't know what the death rate was. So there was an actual sense of, oh, we may actually die. Whereas even though every day you're crossing the street, you could be hit by a car we don't really think when we cross the street, oh, I'm gonna die this time. So that, that imminent feeling could also drive us and compel us to uh, adopt all kinds of interesting actions. So, so, so maybe we, we should talk about this idea of what, what that feeling could do to us because you have so many interesting experiments that actually clinically or empirically prove that this is, uh, this is uh, there. And, and when you first started doing this research, people didn't think that was possible and people disapproved of your work, right? Well, that's right. I'm not. Uh, they did um, disapprove in the sense of either ignoring it or taking ardent issue with it. So, uh, what some uh, and uh, by the way, these are very able and, and um, thoughtful people. But what some psychologists said is, "Well, look, I, I don't think about death all that much, and, and so I can't see how this could possibly be right." And, and we were young and annoying. And so we used to say, yeah, you don't think about death that much because you're comfortably ensconced in your social role as a professor from which you get meaning and value. And according to the theory, that's why death's not on your mind. But of course, you don't win debates that way because you're saying either you agree with me, in which case I'm right, or you say you never think about death and I say you're repressing it, in which case I'm right. <laughs> So am I right or am I right? right? The more compelling concern, yeah, was that there's no evidence. People said, Becker, uh, this is interesting, uh, but it, it's highly speculative. It's derived from existential philosophy and psychoanalysis. There's no evidence and there's no way that you could ever produce it. And so that's where we come in. We, we were young. 
uh, and uh, we were ambitious uh, and we were experimental social psychologists and and we said hey uh, let's give it a try uh, and that's basically what we've been doing for the past 40 years and we've done a variety of experiments you know one line of inquiry as you know from the book was to just demonstrate that self esteem does indeed buffer anxiety uh, that it really is psychodynamically consequential uh, to perceive yourself as a person of value in a world of meaning. And when that is difficult, uh, complications arise. Most of our work though is, is based on what we call the mortality salience paradigm. And it's actually deceptively simple. Our, our, we're like, how are we gonna show the, the, what, how could we possibly get at Becker's claim that my beliefs about reality reduce death anxiety and yours and everybody else's. And, and we, we actually, we had an accident. We were sitting around and we got struck by a thought. We were like, okay, maybe this is pretty simple. Uh, let's just remind people that they're going to die. Let's just ask them about their thoughts and feelings about themselves dying. And in, uh, in control conditions, let's ask people about something neutral, like eating lunch, or, or better yet, let's ask them about something unpleasant but not fatal. You're in a car accident and they had to chop a leg off. You're at the dentist and they have to yank out a tooth. You just failed an important exam. Uh, you got sick and, and vomited while you were giving a speech in public and you were ostracized and embarrassed. All bad stuff, but not dead. And, and what our logic was is that if Becker is right, if there's something unique about concerns about death, then when people are reminded that they're going to die, uh, they should ardently embrace their cultural beliefs and strive to improve their self-esteem. And we should be able to detect that uh, depending upon what we were going to measure thereafter. Usually reactions to other people who either share one's beliefs or who are opposed to them are merely different. So originally we're like, let's just see uh, it, what happens uh, when we do that. Uh, and so in our first experiment was with municipal court judges uh, and uh, we asked them to set a bond, which is just an amount of money an alleged criminal has to pay to get out of jail before their trial. And uh, we divided the judges in half and they randomly, half of them were asked to think about their mortality and, and the others not. And, and then we just asked them, how much money should this person, we showed them a court case. And in the control condition, the average bond was $50. And that's good because that was the average bond for that crime at the time. But the judges reminded of their mortality they set an average bond that was nine times higher, $455. And, and the point is, is that our argument is that what the judges were doing uh, was reacting to the death reminder uh, by punishing a moral transgressor. Now, when we told the judges afterwards what we had done, they said, there's no way that your stupid little death manipulation could have influenced my judgment after all. I'm a judge who was trained to rationally and dispassionately administer the law. You know, to be silly, you better pray you don't, that the judge doesn't drive past the cemetery on the way to court uh, when you're going to go pay your parking ticket. Because clearly, uh, the Grim Reaper put a big fist on the scales of justice. Right, but it's not only negative, Tiger, when we're reminded of our mortality, we respond more favorably to people who do things that are virtuous or who are similar to ourselves. And in the simplest first study, we just reminded some people of death. And then we asked participants, how much monetary reward would you give somebody who uh, did something heroic, like to stop a robbery? And sure enough, in the control condition, it was about $1,000. And in the mortality salience or death reminder condition, uh, it was $3,000. And uh, so uh, to fast forward, you know, a couple of decades, there's now several thousand studies uh, that show uh, that being reminded of death, sometimes, like I said, by being asked to write about it, 
Sometimes we do these studies outside the lab. We stop people either in front of a funeral parlor or a hundred meters to either side. Our thought is that if you're walking by a cemetery or a funeral parlor, death is on your mind, even if you don't know it. And then other times, um, you know, I tell Skidmore students, come to my office and you can read your email on my computer. And while you do that, I'll flash the word death for 28 milliseconds. You milliseconds. won't even see anything. Yes. <laughs> and this is the one that, I, that I, I never believed any of this until that, Tiger, because I'm, we started doing these studies thinking, let's just see. But the, the punchline here is that all of these different ways produce comparable outcomes. You don't even know, you don't even need to know that death is on your mind for it to have a pervasive effect on your attitudes and behavior. Everything from you know who you love and hate to who you voted for in the last election to what kind of stuff um, that you want to buy, how much money you think you'd like to have, even the magnitude of symptoms associated with psychological disorders have been found uh, to be uh, influenced uh, by the extent to which existential anxieties are on our minds. This is just so fascinating because we're talking about even the most minute influences like flashing by, by 28 milliseconds. That's but, correct. But, but even having that would, uh, so in the, in the judge's case, they were judging prostitutes and the judges that saw the word death around them or took a survey about death near them uh, gave harsher punishments because you said they um, thought about their own mortality re reacted by trying to do the right thing as prescribed by their culture. So people really cling on to that cultural identity. Uh, could, we, could we talk a little bit more about this phrase cultural world, worldview? Like how, how do you define culture where the prescribed uh, values in our society. The dominant. Yeah, so yeah, so we go with the Becker's definition here, Tiger. He just he says these are cultural constructions, their beliefs about reality um, that we share with other individuals. And by the way, I do think it's important to. Uh, uh, I I find these ideas provocative. Uh, you know, we're all enamored with our the work that we do. But I was also taught, and I think that this is important, um, to um, not get carried away uh, by one's own ideas. Um, Becker makes big claims that concerns about death have a pervasive influence on human affairs. And I believe that to be demonstrably true, but it doesn't follow from that, that it is the only thing uh, that influences uh, human behavior. And the same is true with culture. All right, so uh, evolutionary psychologists these days, uh, I'm thinking of the head of the anthropology department at Harvard, an uh, uh, able gentleman named Joseph Henrich. And he writes about cultural evolution. And he points out that culture, that's what makes us so smart because it is cumulative. Uh, that we are, all of us that are alive today, the beneficiaries uh, of thousands of years of accumulated wisdom. So in fact, he argues uh, that uh, culture is smarter than any of us because embedded in our cultural practices are, are uh, behaviors that may be, uh, uh, may be essential for our survival, but we may not know why that's the case. And so he gives great examples uh, of cultural traditions uh, where there's certain ways of preparing uh, yams or root crops. Uh, and there are these complex processes by which they're rendered edible. Evidently, if you don't do it, uh, you can eat them, but then they explode in your stomach and you just die of malnutrition. But if you ask the people, well, why do you go through all these steps before you eat the potatoes? They're just like, Oh, I don't know. That's just the way that we do it. And I'm, I'm making this point because to, to a certain extent, uh, there are norms uh, and values uh, that are embedded in cultures that are, are not arbitrary. Uh, they're, they're there because if we like staying alive, it would behoove us uh, to adhere to these practices. Uh, on the other hand, 
Um, there are other elements uh, of culture, you know, the color of our flag, let's say, or, or uh, you know, the, or, or dietary preferences. Uh, they may have nothing to do with survival per se. Uh, and that Becker argues are just ultimately there uh, to give us tangible ways to obtain a sense of meaning and value. So I'm not sure if that uh, is an adequate response to your query, but that, that would be basically Becker's take on culture. Uh, Professor Solomon, I guess just to quickly tie into today's uh, cultural social discourse before we go back to the book, uh, what do you think is really driving our society today? I mean, maybe not one thing, where, where at least do you think that this a uh, feeling of, of terror or, or death or mortality is one of the factors that are driving societal discourse today because we're seeing uh, polarization like we've never seen before. People are really sticking to their tribes. They, they go on Twitter, they wanna own the libs or destroy yeah. uh, whoever. So uh, do you think there is that component to it? Because one really interesting thing in, that you talked about in your book was that right after 9-11, Americans really felt the strong support for President Bush, even though Three, three, three weeks or three months before 9-11, he, he had one of the lowest approval ratings amongst all presidents, but the, the feeling of, of death, uh, of, of terror, of terrorism, all that stuff uh, compelled people to really uh, adhere to whether their own parties or cultural identities or President Bush and so on. So that had dramatic implications for, for the way society was going. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on where you see where we are today. Yeah, well, again, another great question, Tiger. Yeah, I, I see us at a, an inflection point, uh, perhaps, uh, of sorts. I, I, this, there's been many times in human history, some folks have argued, uh, where that we're at a crossroads of sorts. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I've argued, not that that makes me right, but I think that we were already in turbulent times, that um, the um, impending environmental apocalypse, which by the way, not to be somber, um, it's gonna make the pandemic seem like a mild case of indigestion. So uh, we may think about learning from what's happening now because we'll have to multiply it by Avogadro's number uh, of degrees of unpleasantness in order to be prepared for what's to come. But the, back to the point, um, yeah, our, our studies show, for example, that when we remind people of death, um, they become more racist and ethnocentric. When we remind people of death, they're more likely to vote uh, for populist slash charismatic leaders who proclaim uh, that they're divinely ordained to rid the world of evil. When we remind people of death, uh, they want to have more money and more stuff. When we remind people of death, uh, they, uh, people who smoke cigarettes, smoke more cigarettes, candy, cookie people eat more sugar, people who drink, consume more alcohol, marijuana, just fill in the blank, uh, is all magnified gambling, um, uh, watching television. All to the more extreme, basically. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> all the, all the more. And, and then finally, when we remind people of their mortality, that magnifies all pre-existing psychological conditions. And so if you're afraid of snakes, you get more afraid of snakes. If uh, you have OCD, you use more soap and water to wash your hands. Socially anxious people hide in a closet longer and so on. And so in our book about 9-11, uh, the American Psychological Association, the week after or so, they're like, hey, we want you to write a book uh, and we want you to explain what happened and how Americans are going to respond and uh, how we can ensure that this doesn't happen again. And we knew nothing about terrorism. And we said, we'll do our best. But we were, to, if you'll pardon the expression, we were just pissing in the wind. And what we said right after 9-11 is, just based on our studies and assuming that 9-11 was like a giant death reminder, we expected people to, we said hate crimes are gonna go up. Uh, people are gonna vote for George W. Bush. Uh, they're gonna drink more, they're gonna gamble more, they're gonna buy more guns. There's gonna be more uh, incidences or higher rates uh, of all psychological 
dis-ease, you know, slap a hyphen between dis and ease. Well, now fast forward uh, to the pandemic, uh, and I would say that it is the same situation, only more pervasive. Uh, because as you put it, Tiger, not most of us knew after 9-11, you guys weren't here, that we were not likely to be obliterated by an act of terrorism. But almost everybody, if you're not in a coma, knew that this virus is just completely ubiquitous. Well, the same thing uh, has happened since. And, and that is that uh, all of the most unsavory of human affectations have been magnified under these conditions. And uh, that's uh, obviously not great. Uh, on the other hand, and, and you asked a fine question about this uh, when, when we were just uh, you know bouncing things back and forth, but it's this is not to say uh, that it's all bad uh, because the same uh, pervasive sense uh, of being surrounded uh, by death, uh, well, a lot of the existential types that I'm very fond of, uh, they're like, you know what, that, that can make us very anxious, but sometimes we need to be hyper anxious uh, in order for radical transformations, both personal and social, to occur. I see. Would you mind telling us a bit more about the positive side of things? Because it seems that this is all negative. <laughs> yeah, no, of course it is. No, that's absolutely right. Okay, so here's the upside. What we do know from our studies is that death reminders exaggerate pre-existing tendencies. And so some, sometimes, depending upon where one starts, um, there could be good outcomes in the aftermath of a death reminder. All right, to, so uh, just a few examples. Um, we know that, um, that um, when we ask people who describe themselves as liberal, when they're reminded of death, and then we have them rate somebody who's different, they actually like those people more. And that may sound odd, but the me, you know, if you look up the word liberal, it means tolerant and open-minded. And they become more tolerant and open-minded. People who are generous, that they become more generous, uh, at least to, to uh, at least in terms of altruistic responses to people in our own tribe. And, and so that's that's kind of good news. Uh, and so one of the things that I've been wondering about, and of course, this is just uh, highly speculative, uh, but, uh, you know, one of the, the and it's horrif it actually, it horrifies me to speak in these terms, but as you know, and as I hope every American uh, is thinking about, uh, you know, these are very uh, unsettled moments with regard uh, to race relations in the United States. And um, there is, uh, you know, there's been an ongoing stream uh, of violent assaults against people of color uh, and, um, and, uh, and the George Floyd murder seems to have been an inflection point. Uh, and, um, and there's been plenty uh, of uh, atrocious assaults on unarmed black people. Uh, but why uh, did this one provoke the response that it did? Now, some of it's just the sheer horror of the event, but there's plenty of other videos of black men being killed uh, and that have not had the same effect. And, and one of the things that I wonder is whether or not uh, that a, a chunk of, um, uh, of uh, right-minded, well-intentioned, Martin Luther King said, the people that scare me the most are white moderates, because these are folks that mean well, uh, but when it comes right down to it, uh, they're like, yeah, we need to have equality. Uh, and so let's have a 5K run uh, and I'll yeah. give you a T-shirt <laughs> and, and then I'll go home and take a nap. Uh, yeah. and, and Martin Luther King said, you know what, with all due respect, I'll take the Klan because at least I know where they stand. 
And but but what I think is that for some of us, myself included, perhaps the fact and you put it earlier, Tiger, here we are involuntarily isolated, really aware, perhaps for the first time of the reality of our existential vulnerabilities, maybe witnessing that atrocity under those conditions uh, uh, was worldview shattering. Or rather, to put it another way, how about worldview illuminating? There's, there's lots of decent Americans who are white, who mean well, uh, but who are blithely unaware of structural inequalities and, and maybe needed to have their Disney-like sense of American virtue undermined long enough uh, to collectively inspire us uh, to do something about it. And, and, you know, not to sound corny, but this is by no means un-American. It's the ultimate act of patriotism. You're too young, but have you ever heard of Kurt Vonnegut? He was a science fiction writer. Maybe a little bit. Yeah, maybe, maybe a little bit. He wrote <laughs> uh, Cat's Cradle. Anyway, it doesn't matter, but he's a famous dude. Uh, and uh, in the 1970s, uh, he spoke at the University of Kansas when I was a graduate student. And he was well known to be kind of a liberal anti-war guy. And, and somebody in the audience said, why do you hate America? And he got real pissed. He said, don't don't go that way. I love America, uh, but I want America to be in practice what we claim it to be in principle. And uh, I thought that was a, a nice way of thinking about that. So, Professor Solomon, just to make sure I understand the lo logic uh, more completely, it seems that the COVID-19 crisis, by forcing everybody in their homes and confronting this actual real-time threat that you may get the virus and die, that made people react more to this kind of racial terror, th this police brutality, than they otherwise would. So, so in other words, the, the white moderates who has seen many of those videos and known about those issues rationally uh, was finally compelled were confronted by this actual possibility that they would themselves die because of something. And that made them more compelled to act and, and bring forth social justice um, in, in some way. Yeah, I think at least that's one possibility, Tiger, because remember that in our studies, the, the death reminders are very fleeting, uh, you know, and very subtle. And, and, you know, theologians and philosophers as you know, they've been united on this front since antiquity. And that is that any genuine uh, personal growth uh, requires a, a, a long standing, hyper conscious, contemplative engagement with one's mortality. And, and I like how you just put it a, a moment ago that for many of us, uh, you know, these fleeting death reminders we kind of flick them off like rainwater cascading off a duck's ass in a hurricane. It's like, yeah, okay, I'm thinking about death, but now I hate somebody because they look different and I'll just eat another banana and buy more stuff. Uh, and so mostly uh, we spend our days, as I already said, uh, ardently trying to ward off death thoughts. But, 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 for the philosophers and the theologians, you have to overcome that uh, uh, voluntarily or not uh, to where you can get to the point um, where, you know, Socrates is, uh, what is it, to philosophize is to learn how to die. Uh, there's the Tibetan book uh, of the dead. And, and yeah, I guess I'm likening the pandemic uh, to kind of somebody in a contemplative tradition uh, that by virtue of their seclusion uh, is able to, in a mature fashion, in varying degrees of awareness, uh, to kind of see through the culturally constructed mist long enough to apprehend uh, that there's something uh, very desperate going on that requires our immediate attention. And I guess what we happened in COVID-19 was the exacerbation of all trends. P people did become 
more extreme in a bad way in terms of uh, looking at conspiracy theories or supporting yep. certain, uh, as you said, racist or there's xenophobic groups. But there were also that was also a moment of deep reflection where tons of good ideas, I, I guess, were reflections about what America should be came out. So so everything was kind of all trends were exacerbated, and and at least part of the reason should be. Uh, attributed to th th this idea that we were confronted by this uh, imminent threat of death. Um, yeah, I think it's at least a yeah. factor to be tossed into the equation, Absolutely. yes. And we were talking about how you, you brought up this phrase, dis-ease, D-I-S hyphen ease. Uh, and it's really interesting. Um, Kierkegaard, you mentioned this in Lex Friedman's interview, that Kierkegaard said, if you want to grow, you have to go to the school of anxiety. You cannot just go to the uh, some university, and, and it's that disease, uh, and, and uh, maybe we should talk about that a little bit as well. And also, on the on the other hand, there's also Heidegger, who yeah. says that most people do not go to that school; they flee away from that. They tranquilize themselves with the trivial, and they embrace their cultural identity. Uh, so, uh, those are two fascinating views that I think we should really spend some time on. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's do it. And and yeah, uh, that's. Um... Basically, um, you got it. So um, the when I when I use that word disease, you know, I said put a hyphen between dis and ease. That was really my classic comic <laughs> book uh, um, admiration of Heidegger because he makes up all of these words and put dashes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, but uh, he uh, it, he talked about anxiety, and he called uh, in German it's angst uh, and which means anxious, but it has other connotations. Uh, it has a touch of the uncanny. It's a sense of being like unsettled or not quite at home. And Heidegger takes his notion of anxiety from Kierkegaard and they both tie it ultimately to the recognition of our own finitude. All right, so for both of them, uh, what what is again? It, it is the fulcrum upon which our existence ultimately turns, uh, because what uh, Heidegger and Kierkegaard say is that all all of us have this anxiety, uh, and but what they also both say uh, is that uh, one reaction to that anxiety is, as you put it to flee from it. Heidegger called it a flight from death. And, and he said, and, and, what, and what's important to note here, Tiger, is that none of this need be conscious, although some of it might. So Heidegger just said, so did Kierkegaard, that the average person, including us from time to time, our reaction to the anxiety engendered uh, by our own mortality is to flee. And what he means by that is that uh, we flee and, and we frenetically embrace our cultural constructions uh, and our social role in the context of them. And they, believe, they become the sole basis upon which we derive a sense of meaning and value. Uh, in, in my kind of New Jersey sophomoric uh, way of thinking about it, uh, we become culturally constructed meat puppets. Um, and uh, in Heideggerian terms, this is inauthentic because we are fleeing from what he calls our own self. You've become a caricature of a stereotype. And, and, Heide and Kierkegaard introduces the phrase here. He says, those kinds of individuals tranquilize themselves with the trivial. And, and there's two ways that that can happen. One is the passive way, you know, you're sitting back in the hood, you know, spraying cheese whiz on a cracker, downing a 30 pack of beer, uh, watching, uh, you know, another uh, 12 episodes of Law and Order, <laughs> or uh, you can be frenetically tranquilized by the trivial, where you're racing around every day, pretending to be busy as you hurl yourself uh, into a cultural construction being sure that you never sit still long enough to wonder if that's who you really are and what you would really like to do. All right, so that's the downside. Those are the meat puppets tranquilized by the trivial. And you might say, well, they're not bothering anybody, uh, but, um, but they are. Heidegger's point in later work is that 
These are the folks that are indirectly or, or directly responsible for trashing the environment. Heidegger in the 1960s, he was concerned about uh, the way that humans use technology. And he basically said, we're using it in a death denying way that we want an infinite standing reserve. That was the term that he used for nature that we want to control nature so that it's like a 24 hour convenience store. Uh, and that uh, ultimately, uh, although that would be great, uh, that that's a shocking and arrogant misunderstanding of nature's bounty, which is certainly copious, but not guaranteed uh, on a 24 seven basis. And, and then as Hannah Arendt pointed out, and she was one of Heidegger's students, uh, you know, Heidegger was a fucking Nazi. That's why I didn't read his work for 40 years. But, <laughs> but Nazis are people too. But the point is, is that it was Hannah Arendt who pointed out that yeah. it's your culturally constructed meat puppet puppets that are the fertile ground uh, for fascism. And, and so anyway, there's I a see. downside to puppethood. All right, but let's go with the upside, the school of anxiety. Um, yeah, I found this stunning. Um, because when I first read Becker, uh, it was in my first year of being a Skidmore professor. I was so blown away. I took a year off. I'm like, I have to, if this guy's right, then I'm a meat puppet. I got to figure out uh, who I am. And I, I like the notion of the school of anxiety. You want to learn stuff, uh, you know, a, a, a discourse. If I want to learn history, I got to go to a history department. Uh, but if I want to pursue authenticity in the existential sense of the word, then I have to matriculate in the school of anxiety. All right, so back to Kierkegaard. He said, look, anxiety uh, is a multidimensional construct. It repels us, but it also attracts us. Uh, and uh, again, I, I'm not a philosopher, I, uh, I, but I, uh, I find these ideas compelling uh, where he says that and this is a Kierkegaard idea, which is that anxiety is yourself calling to yourself, telling you that you're not yourself. It, it's literally a, a wake up call from the depths uh, to just uh, garner our attention, which of course is what our emotions are designed to do. And, and Heidegger's point is that, uh, that when we see the anxiety that, that is associated with our mortality uh, as something that's calling attention to ourselves, uh, then that, that opens up in his, is his language. It, it opens up a, a mental horizon that gives us metaphorically an opportunity to kind of step back and, and reflect and, and ideally, will have what he calls a moment of vision, which may not take a minute and you may never know that you're having it. And what happens in this moment of vision is that you literally realize the arbitrary and somewhat fictitious nature of the cultural constructions that you have used to define yourself. English translation, I say, oh, I'm Sheldon Solomon. I was born in Brooklyn. I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a male, I'm a professor in the 21st century. Yeah, well, so what? I could have been born in Mongolia in the third century as an illiterate goat herder, you know, or maybe even the goat or, or a pomegranate or, uh, you know, a lemur for all I know. And the, the Heidegger point is that you realize that in a sense uh, that, that that's all cultural mist. Cultural mist in the sense that it's historically conditioned. You dropped into the world. In Heidegger's terms, you're thrown into the world in a time and place not of your choosing. And therefore, Heidegger says, on some levels, you realize that you're ultimately a cultural caricature. Uh, well, uh, he's like, okay, uh, well, what next? I realize uh, that a good deal of my identity is socially interjected. Well, no, now what? Uh, and now he says that there's two things that have to happen in order to graduate uh, from the school of anxiety. One is that you've got to come to terms 
uh, with your own death. That's my, one of my favorite Albert Camus lines, come to terms with death thereafter, anything is possible. Uh, and, uh, but the Heidegger point is it, it's not enough to say, oh, I know I'm gonna die because what most people, myself included, say to themselves either out loud or, or they're thinking it is I'm gonna die someday. In, in other words, when we put our death at some vaguely unspecified future moment, Heidegger's point is that that's still death denial. You know, you're trying to toss some chunks of time between you and reality, and that denies the fact that every one of us are perpetually vulnerable to being summarily annihilated. You know, I, don't, I hope it doesn't happen, uh, you know, but again, uh, if a rock comes through the window and knocks my head off in the next 10 seconds, I'm done. Uh, and uh, there's innumerable folks who are unfortunately have their lives curtailed uh, every day. And so the point here is that death denial uh, in Heideggerian terms uh, is the realization that the absolute end of our existence is always potentially imminent. All right, if we can get that far, uh, then we can go to the next part, which is to um, accept um, what they call existential guilt. And this is not a moral transgression. This is just accepting that even though uh, you're dumped into the world uh, under conditions that you have no control over or discretion about, that you still uh, are, in Sartre's words, condemned to choose. Uh, and so here's the existentialist um, putting us through the psychological ringer again, because they're like, oh, everybody loves choice. And we all get pissed when you take our choices away. And yet we like choice, but we don't like to accept our responsibility for our bad choices. And moreover, some of us are paralyzed by indecision when we have too much choice. You ever choke on choices where you can't do anything? And so the existentialists, these guys are brutal. They're like, you have to accept the fact that you need to choose, that sometimes you're going to make bad choices and or you're not going to make choices where and in so doing have squandered opportunities. And I, I love Maria Rilke, Romanian poet of yesteryear. He, he talked about the guilt of unlived life, that every one of us in our more somber moments know that we have diminished ourselves by virtue of our choices or a lack thereof. Well, so anyway, the Heidegger says, let's say that you do that, what's gonna happen uh, on the other side? And here he goes all Buddhist in a sense, because Buddha said enlightenment is quite ordinary. And Heidegger makes the same point. He's like, no, you're going to come back to the same world and it's not going to look much different, but it's going to be completely different. And Heidegger's words, he, he calls, he talks about um, solicitous regard. Uh, for other entities and our fellow humans. He's like, oh, you're going to care more uh, about the things and the people around you. And I like that there's a social dimension to his depiction of what an authentic person would be like. He, he's big on this idea, uh, 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 as opposed to like a Cartesian dualism that puts us as passive disembodied spectators. Heidegger will have none of that. He's like, we are actively engaged uh, in the world around us from minute one. And at our best, we are actively concerned about uh, the people and the things around us. All right? And then he keeps going though, Tiger. He's like, all right, uh, how would that person be? And he says, he has a phrase, anticipatory resoluteness. I love that one. All right. Anticipatory, we yeah. all know that word, looking forward. I, resolute, I had to look that one up, but it's to be admirably and persistently determined. All right, and then he keeps going. He's like, all right, and, and then what? And then he says something like, uh, 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 under these conditions, life 
feels like a, an ongoing adventure that is completely perfused with unshakable joy. And I, I was like, this is awesome. And this was way before hallucinogens in the 1960s. And here's uh, where he's describing uh, this, and I'm being a little silly here, but uh, you know, this sounds uh, like a tremendous way to be that I believe all of us have had glimpses of. Uh, when, when we are at our best, I would submit, we are concerned about the folks around us. And we are looking forward and we are, even if we don't know exactly what we're doing, uh, where our looking forward is done in a resolute fashion. And, and again, maybe I'm just getting nostalgic, but I do like this idea uh, of seeing life as an ongoing epic journey uh, where we each get to play a prominent role. And, and I do like this idea of unshakable joy even though, and I'll shut up in a minute, this is not to suggest that that obliterates anxiety or suffering. Uh, quite the contrary. Uh, you know, there's no free lunch to partake of uh, what is the most joyous and uplifting of our humanity requires that we be open uh, to extraordinary pain and suffering from time to time. Uh, so uh, this is uh, not to suggest that there is a way to wish away our sorrows or anxiety. Uh, what these folks are suggesting, um, if I understand them, is that there is a way to parlay uh, anxieties that are intrinsic to the human condition into catalysts for both personal growth and social progress in the best sense of the word. Uh, Professor Sullivan, I have to say that that might just be one of the most powerful monologues we've ever had on this podcast. That was just well, know, amazing. No, that was, no, that was, thank you. Really, uh, the, I, yeah. I, I, again, I'm a, I am a rank amateur. I just wanna be sure that everybody understands me here. I, I just ran into these ideas uh, uh, two or three years ago and I guess I, I find them very compelling. I, I guess just to quickly recap, because we started off by talking about anxiety, the school of anxiety. Yes. And, we, and you talked about meat puppets, which we should come back to in, in a bit. Very, very interesting. And the Heidegger. And what we're saying is to graduate from the school of anxiety, two things would need to happen. One is to come, term, come to terms with your own death. And it's not enough to just say we will eventually die. You have to be immersed with the possibility that you could die at any moment. Yes. And, that, and that is really hard. And the second thing is you have to accept that ex existential guilt. And, and, and you were saying that, and it's the, the phrase that uh, you, were, you were trying to say that you put beautifully just now, and also on Life Street Man's podcast, you were saying that um, you, you would see a, what Heidegger was saying, you see a horizon of opportunity that makes you in this state of anticipatory resoluteness uh, with solid, solidious regard for others that make your life seem like an adventure perfused with unshakable joy. You got it. You're going to be doing this when I feel <laughs> over. <laughs> which is which is so such such a beautifully written sentence that, that gives you that idea of of coming out of this anxiety or, or after the confrontation of death, and then realizing something greater about yourself. Yeah. So, so so which I would love to come back to that that process a little bit more because certainly for people who have who have had near death experience they, they might experience that and we see people coming out of car accidents becoming more mature they live in the moment and they appreciate life more what about day-to-day -day people like like me kids like me who seem to have nothing to worry about in some way how do we how do we make young people or, or, or just people every day uh, to to have that realization i guess that's the first part of why don't we answer that part of the question? I have too many questions. So, so yeah. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, um, I, again, at the risk of sounding silly, I, I honestly, I think that, I think these ideas are timely and important. I think they're particularly valuable to people your age. And as I'm uh, 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 again, I don't mind annoying people because I'm, I'm on the cusp of oblivion, Tiger, in, in the sense that I've been doing this for a long time. And I'm 
I'm concerned about the future of education because um, we have great schools in, in the United States, but I feel like at the college, at the university level, uh, we're preparing students for a world that no longer exists, even if it ever did. And I'm a, a lot of these ideas used to be just standard parts of a liberal arts education curriculum. And it, I, I wish that they, it's, it seems to me that I, I wish some of these ideas were just brought up more routinely in academic discourse, but I'm not sure that that'll necessarily happen. And I'm not sure that that's the way of the world as we now know it. Um, you know, we're, here we are talking and I, I've listened to some of your shows, you know, just to get a feel for things. You guys are like awesome. When people ask me what next, I'm like, you guys are next. Uh, young people um, with uh, 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 who are anticipatory and resolute without necessarily knowing specifically how their aspirations will be manifested. I, I just, um, it's the youth that give me hope because they are to varying degrees, either vaguely or not so vaguely aware that although we've got a lot of good things going for us, there's a lot that needs to be done. And uh, I, I'm cautiously optimistic that it's by virtue of these kinds of exchanges. Uh, we don't know, maybe 12 people will listen to us talk. And maybe one of them is the next, you know, Barack Obama or Mother Teresa or Gandhi, or maybe, you know, there'll be 12 million people. Uh, and either way, uh, I am I, I, uh, a, a dead guy, Henry Miller, he wrote novels in, in the last century. And, and, you know, he just said, well, he said two things. Uh, he quotes an, a dead Indian dude, Krishna Murte. He says, everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to change themselves. So why don't you start in the mirror? <laughs> Love that one. Right. And then, <laughs> then Henry Miller says, and you know what? Uh, of course, we all want to do something, you know, big. It'd be great to be like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Joan of Arc or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, is that most of us will not necessarily have that pronounced an effect. And yet we just don't know. And, and that's back to my point uh, where I said, oh, maybe 12 people will listen to us, but one of them might be moved uh, to, uh, uh, to do something uh, because of it. And so there's downstream consequences uh, that are unforeseen but grounds for tremendous hope. I mean, you've already said that you were not familiar with these ideas, and yet you encountered them at a time in your life uh, where you found them uh, you know, to be provocative and personally relevant. And, and that's what gives me hope is like, yeah, let's just scatter them out there and, and uh, see how they can be um, exploited in the best sense of the word uh, by folks in every walk of life. I, I, I think that this has very broad applicability as, as just a way to look at living in general. Uh, just to quickly go back to this idea, I mean, we were talking about young people and you brought up the phrase meat puppet. And I think a lot, a lot of people in my age, we, we often say, uh, uh, or, or just today in the intellectual discourse, people use the word herd. You know, you, you follow the herd, you're part of the herd and, and so on. And, and I wanted to quickly ask you this because I, I feel like maybe for young people, maybe for a lot of people in general, you kind of have to be in the system or follow the herd for a little bit and then in order to kind of realize who you are. And I say that, so for example, when I first got to Princeton, when I was a freshman, I, I don't think I immediately had the idea, I wanna do something different, start a podcast, interview scholars. I probably also applied to the same sure. clubs like everybody else, tried to get same good grades, applied to the same jobs. And then maybe two years later, three years later, once you had failures or successes, you have a better sense of who you wanna be. But so it, it I guess my question would, would be, do you think everybody kind of had to struggle through some kind of process that 
might not be so unique or it might be mundane. It might be just bad. And then something nice comes out of it because it, you, you were saying how you yourself even felt like you were being a meat puppet in, in some way, being in academia and academia especially has that push for certain people, everybody to behave in the same way, publish at the same journals. And then obviously a lot of great scholars when they got tenure, they come out of it and they say, oh, I realized this could have happened, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but yeah, you went through the whole pipeline and you succeeded. And <laughs> so, so I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. So, so it seems that a lot of people that really came out of the process enlightened and, and not being part of the herd is really because they succeeded in being the herd. Yeah, so you make a, that, that's a very fine point. Uh, the herd gets a bad name, by the way, because remember <laughs> that we're fundamentally yeah. social creatures. Uh, and... I don't see our affection for our fellow humans or even conformity to their behaviors and traditions uh, as, um, as to be denigrated in an a priori fashion. So uh, some degree of conformity and adherence to group norms is necessary to perpetuate culture. And, you know, I grew up in the hippie days where th that would have been hard for me to admit, where we used to just be like, oh, you're supposed to resist authority, uh, you know, no matter where it comes from. Uh, I think I've matured a bit, although not nearly commensurate with my age, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can now accept. I like how, how you put it, Tiger. We're all products of a socialization process. We're all human, and therefore, to a certain degree, at least at first, our, our self-esteem is fortified uh, by the sense that we're accepted by those around us. And yeah, I think that the kind of person that uh, we're describing it is a, a, a product of ideally uh, a, a a coherent and functional group. Uh, and by virtue uh, of Heidegger calls it individuating, you know, you come to realize your own self. His point is, is that uh, that doesn't mean that you arrogantly distance yourself from the herd thereafter. In fact, he would submit if that's what you did, then you, that's kind of a fake transition. Or uh, rather, uh, the argument is that you rejoin the group uh, as a person who has the sublime capacity to retain your own individuality, while at the same time being to extend yourself in, jointly uh, in cogitations with others and in collaboration with the culture writ large. I, I see. So, so because we're social creatures, because there's still a lot of those factors such as, I mean, going back to our original discussion about terror management, you, you have to have cultural worldviews and religions and related things to, to help you fortify that self-esteem and cultural worldview. And, and then gradually you grow out of that and you, you develop your own sense of uh, way to confront with anxiety, with, with that and so on. So, but but that, that process, someone needs to happen, That's as right. you were saying. Well, wow, this is just all so, so powerful. I, I, I mean, it was, and you also, going back to Kierkegaard and uh, Heidegger, this contrast, um, you, you, you were saying that Kierkegaard is a leap of faith in God and Heidegger is a leap of faith in life. And, and would you mind telling us a little bit more about this idea of leap of faith? Yes. Because I, re I really think that, that, that was the phrase that when I listened to your interview with Lex Friedman, I think that was the phrase that really clicked with me and, and changed me. Yeah, me too. So this is awesome. Again, not to uh, make us uh, reduce us to data points, Tiger, but I, I was not much older than you when I was really, um, it was transformative. Uh, and I, I, it was at a time in my life where I, I wasn't so sure. I certainly wasn't anticipatory or resolute. Uh, you know, I, 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 I was kind of a discombobulated uh, just pile of pulsating neurons <laughs> without uh, <laughs> any seeming purpose or direction. I know it sounds stark, but like I finished a PhD, I got a job as a professor and I'm like sitting around going, I, I don't know, 
you know, <laughs> what? And anyway, I read the denial of death and it was the chapter on Kierkegaard and this, the school of anxiety that I found most compelling because basically Heidegger's point is here you are and you've just metaphorically dispensed of your culturally constructed identity. You know, you realize, uh, you know, again, I, I'm, a, I'm a guy from New York in the 20th century who's a professor you know I could have been a goat or uh, you know or goat herder could have been anything it's all arbitrary and it's all contingent and in in Kierkegaard's terms after I have uh, momentarily obliterated my the culturally constructed aspects of my identity I'm at psychological ground zero I am no one and no thing, which the ancient Greeks, that was like when you're uh, exiled and ostracized, you're a nobody, you have no identity. Now, of course, at this moment, you can tumble into the existential abyss, but, uh, uh, but you can also, and here comes the leap of faith. Uh, according to Kierkegaard, it is at this moment and it is, it is ultimately a leap of faith because uh, there, is, there is no empirical justification, nor can there ever be for any reasoned argument about the notion that life is intrinsically meaningful. And so, you know, here you are, you know, reduced to a psychological jellyfish without any substance, structure, or direction, uh, and uh, you have to resurrect yourself. You have to reconstruct yourself as you actually are, and for Kierkegaard, that requires a, a leap of faith, and, and in his view, it is a leap of faith in God, uh, in specifically Christianity, uh, and, um, uh, and that's one way uh, of thinking about this. Uh, and uh, But Heidegger, who's often referred to as a secular version of Kierkegaard, uh, he doesn't use the word faith. I, I do on his behalf, because to me, to be anticipatory and resolute, I'm going to put, I'm going to play loose with words and just say, I, I, I just use the term faith in life as my depiction uh, of what Heidegger's saying to contrast it with, with Kierkegaard. You know, and sometimes people have asked me, um, I, on a lot of the uh, opportunities I've had to speak have been on shows uh, where Jordan Peterson ha has spoken oh, yes. <laughs> in the past. Uh, and Jordan and I go way back. Uh, and uh, last time I saw him was right before his book came out that made him famous. Uh, and we had a great day together. We were at a festival where we were asked to talk about in Canada uh, a Shakespeare play, Macbeth, at, at a summer uh, program, and it was just awesome. Uh, and um, a lot of times, people are like, "You dis, you guys disagree about everything," and we don't. Uh, uh, we um, we agree about more than we differ, uh, because common to the way that we both think about things is this idea that we're fundamentally meaning-making creatures. Uh, where we part company, uh, but again, I, I wish Jordan were here uh, uh, because we would be having a, a great conversation. Um, one of the things we lack in our world right now is, is to have civil disagreements. Uh, that's in the old days uh, how one learned. Uh, in fact, it's the basis upon which democracy uh, was originally formed. The whole idea is through civil disagreements but with people uh, that you can come to some consensus. But anyway, be it as it may, what I would say is that uh, Jordan uh, has gone in the Kierkegaard direction in terms of his predilections about what's best uh, for obtaining the kind of meaning uh, that he believes is fundamentally important. I would say I swing more uh, in the Heidegger direction. So we have the same overall 
conception of what ultimately motivates humans, and that's the pursuit of a sense of meaning and value. Uh, where we differ uh, is about the best way to, to proceed thereafter. Uh, Professor Solomon, could we just talk a little bit more about your uh, differences with Jordan Peterson? Because I think that that could also tie into what the current social discourse is at, because Jordan Peterson is a very controversial figure in today's discussion. He's part of the, the quote unquote intellectual dark web or something. You know, there, there's kind of that conservative uh, religious bent to some of his uh, ideas. And he's often seen by many in the society as a dangerous force, dangerous social theory, blah, blah, blah. So, and there are people who are obviously millions of people that follow him and love him enthusiastically. So uh, I guess part of my question is to, to ask you, um, elaborate a bit more on your differences with him. But on the other hand, uh, wh why do you see Jordan Peterson has become such a cultural phenomenon in some ways? Does that in any way signify how the society is lost in some way and they, they're looking for more anchors uh, to something and, and Jordan Peterson is providing them, you know, 12, 12 rules on life. And he just released his new book, Beyond Order, 12 more rules for life. and. and Oh, I didn't know there was a new book. Okay, there is a there's a new book that, that just came out. So, uh, literally like a month ago. So, so uh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I think uh, basically um, uh, Rollo May, an existential uh, psychotherapist, he wrote a book called The Cry for Myth, and uh, what he said. Other people have said this also. Oswald Spangler, another dead guy, and a book called Decline of the West. Uh, and this goes back to Nietzsche in the gay science, Nietzsche's famous proclamation, God is dead um, in the 1870s. You got to read the rest of the paragraph because he goes on to say Christianity has become unbelievable. And his point is that there we were in the 1800s. You had uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. You had the Industrial Revolution. You had um, just uh, capital-based economies really providing goods and services that look like magic. Uh, and Nietzsche's point is that the, the big worldviews that have sustained us as groups for millenniums no longer uh, held potent sway. And, and he said for the next 200 years or so, uh, things are going to be quite unsettled and tumultuous. And often what happens, according to Rollo May, is that when a prevailing worldview no longer serves, the needs that underlie them do not go away. We just have to find different ways uh, of adapting to them. All right, so we don't believe in God anymore, but we believe in money, or, or we believe in Donald Trump, some Americans, has become a God, or for a lot of young guys, uh, Jordan Peterson has become a god. And, and I think that's um, a, a pretty good way of thinking about it. This is not to suggest uh, that the ideas themselves uh, are sacred. Well, they are sacred to the people that embrace them, uh, but it's not science at that point. Uh, you know, it, it's a cult. Uh, and uh, with all of the unfortunate manifestations that um, accrue uh, thereby. Professor Solomon, we were talking about religion and faith, Jordan Peterson, and, and maybe I guess one quick thing I wanted to hear your thoughts on is uh, the respective roles of faith and reason in, in holding our society together. And I'm, and I'm not sure if my view on this is correct, but I was talking to a very good friend of mine that day, and he was saying that uh, it, if we simplify the intellectual history or, or the way we look at things, there's faith and there's reason. Faith is this kind of belief that God exists or so on, or, or belief in something should happen. And reason is you rationalize things, you conduct scientific studies. And he was saying that if you believe in faith, but you don't have, you, you, but you don't believe in reason, then you believe in religion, right? Because you, you cannot actually prove that there is a God that exists, but you have faith that exists and that holds things together. If you have reason, but you don't have faith, that might be some enlightenment ideals. And if you have both faith and reason, then that seems to be a little bit contradictory because it's very hard to reason through why God objectively exists and, and uphold that reason while still having faith 
um, and, and so on. So I, I don't know if I'm characterizing this dichotomy correctly at all, but I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on, we, we were talking about faith, we were talking about social constructs. It seems that there's a lot of narratives that are holding yeah. society together. What, what about the role of reason? Reason's good, um, I but guess, I like this by the way, Stephen dude, Pinker, um, this, who yeah. was a, a Freud disciple. He called reason a secret psychosis. The point being that the, the, the either one uh, by itself it is problematic. Uh, faith without reason, you're schizophrenic. Reason without faith, and you're the Unabomber or whatever. But the the point is, is I don't see them as mutually exclusive. I, I see um, rationality as a subset of potentially valuable human attributes. Uh, and uh, faith, I, I think, again, that this is, you know, we're going to be dancing around, you know, different uh, semantic definitions. But um, I mean, Newton was an alchemist, so he had religious sentiments. Um, Einstein was religious. So with all due respect to your friend, a lot of smart guys who are quite reasonable would profess having faith. Similarly, you don't want to get into an epistemological debate with a Jesuit. Um, so, um, you know, some of the Bernard Larnigan the structure of meaning, they're, they're some of the most devout people on the planet uh, will crush any of us in any rational discourse. So I'm actually babbling a bit that you surprised me with that one, Tiger, because that's a good <laughs> one. No, no, I'm going to we may have to regroup at, at some point. I'm not I'm not happy with my response to that one. No, uh, I, but I, but but I, I, I it's a great question. And uh, but there is a, a Freudian perspective. Um, and by the way, you might tell your friend to read uh, Descartes' Error, which is a book by uh, Antonio Damasio, who is a neurosurgeon, who points out that neuroanatomically, uh, reason that is severed from emotion it is completely dysfunctional. So in other words, the most intact uh, cognitive apparatus of the human animal uh, requires emotional, intuitive, non-rational input. You know, and this gets back to, I can't remember which uh, uh, ancient Greek metaphor this is, but it was somebody who saw like uh, uh, the mind like a chariot with two horses where one is passion and one is reason. Uh, and basically the idea is to have both of them go in full force, but in a balanced way. Professor Solomon, I wasn't trying to blindside you, but I. Oh no, this you can really, me. That's awesome. Uh, honestly, <laughs> uh, just so, just something on that that came on my mind as well, because I, I guess the core of my question was really to trying to get a feel of what, what you see as holding the society together these days. Were was driving uh, the the sort of human actions, were the cultural clashes that we're seeing today? Because it seems that there's a lot of stuff going on, and I guess it's another perspective I would love to present to you and, and possibly hear your thoughts on is that a lot of people are critiquing that we, we live in a quote unquote postmodern society these days where truths don't seem to matter as much. It's by the way, kids at my age love to say these things to make themselves sound smart. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, so we're in the postmodern society. Truths don't matter as much. And it seems that we're in a more de destructive uh, environment in a, than a generative environment, especially for academia in, in this age where if you look at pre-modernism, a lot of the yeah. academia was about building blocks. And nowadays it's more like melting things away and saying why previous structures were racist, were bad, were so on. So I, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this thing because we were talking about how death, that, that confrontation drives human actions. Yeah. We were talking about religion. And social contrast. So, so do, you, do you have any thoughts on this matter? Yeah, I do, Tiger. That's a great point. Yeah, I'm a I'm a fossil. Um, I come from the hippie days, but I'm a big fan of truth. Um, I, I find it um, epistemologically unattainable, but it is it does exist, 
and uh, it is worth striving towards. And I am ardently opposed to a completely relativistic position uh, vis-a-vis some postmodern views uh, that uh, there's just different ways of coming to know the world, all of which are equally valid to the extent that I subscribe to them. Uh, I, I find that to be narcissistic madness. The, but I'm not, this is not to suggest that there aren't other fine aspects to those discourses, but I, um, I, I find them troubling. Uh, and part of why I find all of this troubling, not only in the academy, but in our society right now, is that Hannah Arendt, in her book about fascism, she says the first things that fascists do is they try to lobotomize the public by discrediting the notion of truth. So and I don't know how political we want to or need to right. get here, but remember that the biggest liar in the history of Earth used to be Hitler until former President Trump <laughs> um, uh, beat him substantially. Uh, and this is this was more, according to Hannah Arendt, the, the lying is more uh, than just a, a political ploy. It's actually a psychological strategy to render people malleable uh, in order to pave the way for totalitarianism. And I know this might sound very stark, uh, but um, that is what happens. So Hannah Arendt says that uh, totalitarians, they come to power uh, generally by winning an election with a minority. And then once they're in power, uh, they work very hard to use democracy to end democracy. And the way that you do that, the overriding way is you have to turn people uh, into, uh, you have to lobotomize people by rendering the very notion of truth suspect. So again, back to uh, President, former President Trump, you know, he lied every day before the election. On the day of the inauguration, he lied about whether it was raining or the number of people there. Uh, then you had alternative facts by uh, Kellyanne Conway. Then you had Rudy Giuliani saying truth is not truth. Uh, well, here we are um, in a situation where the average American um, doesn't believe in the theory of evolution. Uh, like uh, one third of Americans think that the sun revolves around Earth. Most Americans believe that there's really, that, that basically the truth is whatever you feel like believing, this is bad. I mean, it, it's bad for so many reasons, but um, including the fact that democracy requires uh, an implicit, if not explicit agreement that there are such things as facts and truth not that we will ever agree about what they are, but if there's no facts, if there's no truth, except for I, I passionately follow whoever screams the loudest, it, it's not a great condition for us to be in. And, and uh, it does give me, uh, well, I have, uh, yeah, grave apprehensions right now uh, about the future of democracy. Um, I, I'll be dead, but in 10 or 20 years, when you guys take over, I, I think we're in good shape, but we need a lot of white guys to die quickly. Um, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Professor Solomon, by, by the way, based on your, your uh, intellectual and, and physical uh, vitality, I would say you would, you would live much longer, much longer than 10, 20 years. Uh, All right, we'll see. <laughs> But but so so it sounds like you're not very optimistic, are you? No, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic because of you guys, the youth. I, I, I really I, do, I think we're in a race because I don't um, I, I feel like uh, at the risk of sounding overly polemic, 
Yeah, there are a confluence of daunting difficulties. You know, we're basically, uh, it's already too late to, um, to turn back the, the tide in terms of, of climate. And so we're gonna have uh, a lot of stuff uh, to deal with. Um, I, I think it's also the case that it related with that uh, it is just the realization that a, a multinational global economic order uh, puts everybody at, at extraordinary risk, despite when things are going well, uh, how comfortable it makes us. So I think we're going to need to attend to that. My understanding of pandemics is that this is the first of a succession of ones that will be increasingly troubling. Uh, and so we have all of these problems that require, I would argue, both local action as well as global coordinated cooperation. And, and it's a bad moment right now when existential anxieties are pushing a lot of countries in a more populist, isolated kind of mentality. I think we'll need to overcome that. Uh, but uh, what I find uplifting is just the sentiments uh, of the youth in our country right now. I point out to the students at Skidmore or any young people that uh, I get to talk to, I'm like, look, you guys, uh, if you register to vote and actually exercise what's not only your right, but your responsibility, uh, you're in a position to turn the tide. See, right now, demographically, there's too much power in too few hands. And it turns out to be in the hands of essentially uh, not particularly well-educated white males. No disrespect. The boomers. The boomers. <laughs> that's correct. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that um, they're not, their minds are not going to change. And so we just have to wait for them to evaporate. Uh, I'm, I'm uplifted by what I see. And I'm not saying people are perfect. I'm saying that I see the youth perhaps by virtue uh, of the stark reality of the moment. Uh, I see you all uh, as more tolerant, uh, more ecumenical, um, at your best, more nimble uh, and flexible. Uh, and and, and it, I find that to be promising. Moreover, uh, you're at the vanguard of intersecting uh, with these technologies, which on the one hand uh, can be extraordinarily problematic. You couldn't have uh, Orange Hitler or Donald Trump without Twitter. Uh, I, I, so there's, there are, in some ways, uh, these technologies are contributing to the lobotomizing uh, of the American mind. But in the, it's not the technology itself, because it was the same technology that gave us the Arab Spring. And so I, I'm, I'm putting my faith in young folks seizing the moment, uh, having that sublime capacity to use technology without being anesthetized by it. And even if I'm wrong, and of course I can be, I'd rather uh, be deluded in that fashion than to assume then, say, the opposite. You the know, in which case, yeah. let's just meet in the back of the grocery store and we'll chug some wool light together. <laughs> so, so, Professor Solomon, I guess the follow-up question would be, what would be your vision, or uh, say you can, you have a button and you can do anything now to get us out of this, what would be some of the ways that, that you could think about? Because I guess on the policy side, people would say a response to this current trend is to go back to technocratic governments that uh, care more about truth, more about uh, the, the, the broader people and have more egalitarian policies and so on. But, but what about in terms of uh, social theories or in terms of the, the kind of dominant strains of ideas or movements that should dominate our cultural discourse. What are some of the intellectuals or philosophers or, or so on that you think could get us out of that? Maybe Steven Pinker, maybe someone else? Yeah, so again, this is where um, I, I put Steven Pinker, again, with all due respect, in the same category as Jordan, people that are smarter than me, uh, but who I happen to disagree with. Uh, the, the Pinkers of the world 
are um, just like Jordan. They're they're devoted to the proposition that uh, the best way to make things better is to just keep doing what we're doing. That that uh, a basically a, a market based economy um, where everybody pursues their uh, own interests is um, it is the best way to proceed uh, and. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically unrestrained competition in pursuit of excellence. So in, in Pinker's last book uh, the, about uh, what was it, reason, Our Better Angels? Yes, Reason, Human Progress. And yeah, human and, and I'm like, I find that, uh, again, it, I'm ambivalent because things have never been better for me. Uh, but he dismisses the Holocaust as an anomaly. He's like climate change, no big deal. Uh, nuclear weapons, yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm with uh, people like Robert J. Lifton or a British dude, John Gray, uh, who take ardent issue with that uh, naively optimistic view. Uh, and uh, I, I'm persuaded um, more recently, uh, have you heard of a guy, Michael Sandel? He's a philosopher yes, at, the at Harvard. Tyranny and, of credentialism. And yeah, the tyranny of yeah. merit. I love that yes. book. I'm on that side of things, and while this uh, this no disrespect uh, to the these again great thinkers who hold other views, uh, but the Sandel point of view is that meritocracy sounds great, and it has served us well, uh, but it has also there's been it's it's a very uh, problematic way of thinking about things, and so basically. The Pinkers of the world and Jordan, they're all about meritocracy. It, it's not about equal opportunity. It's about outcome. We all need to, to you know, be the best that we can. And, and I like Sandel's point, uh, which is that, uh, you know, well, he has a number of points, but he's like, look, uh, in, a, in a world where the only thing that matters is being the best at what you do, He's like, well, two things happen. The people that are the best become narcissistic almost to the point of sociopathic because they don't, uh, this is a Reinhold Niebuhr, a Protestant theologian said, we always take too much credit for our success and avoid responsibility for our failures. And, and this is where I, I'm with Hillary Clinton who says it takes a village uh, to raise a person. Or when Bill Gates says, yeah, I created Microsoft, but that's because the society around me gave me the skills and the technology to do that. So even the great Sandel point out are the products of their surroundings. And his point is that if you're not the best, uh, well, then you're either demoralized or humiliated. And so here we are uh, in a country uh, where uh, we've got uh, you know, the upper crust, you know, to be glib, uh, basically narcissistic sociopaths claiming exclusive credit for their accomplishments. And then everybody else is either depressed to the point where they're killing themselves, or they become enraged uh, in a way that is responsible for the election of folks like Donald Trump. Uh, and what Sandel points out is, is that that there's a, a middle ground or there's another way of thinking about things. And that's to acknowledge that we're social animals. And of course we all need to feel good about ourselves, but for most of human history, you could feel good about yourself by just fulfilling the role that you inhabited in the context of your culture. See, I don't wanna sound like father time tiger, but I was the last generation of Americans where it was okay to be average. Remember the average person is average. So when I was a kid, you could suck and still get to play on the baseball team. Or you could get a C in chemistry and you wouldn't have to disembowel yourself in the parking lot because you might know that you're not good in chemistry, but uh, you're better in poetry, let's say. Now we're in this place uh, where if you come to college and you don't have a thousand Facebook friends and your own startup or NGO, you're already a, a failure. Uh, and 
it shouldn't surprise us that we live in a world right now where the rate of depression in the United States is 10 times what it was um, in the aftermath of World War II. So I'm, I'm more of the Sandel persuasion, uh, which is that meritocracy is in some ways a psychological ruse to justify a particular kind of economic organization uh, as opposed to what would be the best expression of human nature uh, that you've heard me blubber about before. And that's one that maximizes opportunities for individual accomplishment and creative expression, but that does so in a context that also acknowledges our social nature uh, and, um, and the kinds of institutions, government or economic uh, that might result from that acknowledgement. That sounds wonderful, Professor Solomon, because it goes back to, I guess, the recent tension of economic debates when people talk about whether we should adopt a more social democratic or egalitarian uh, set of policies instead of this laissez-faire, creative destruction, libertarian view of how we should run the economy, basically. Yeah. And, and I guess a lot of people, a lot of my friends in Silicon Valley would say, yes, we acknowledge that this creative destruction idealism has created a lot of problems, but without that, you also wouldn't have Google and Amazon and all those amazing companies. And you, and, and sure, Germany or Sweden are much more egalitarian, but they're also smaller economies. They're also less on the edge and frontier of innovation and so on. So it seems that there's a trade-off. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I do think it's a trade. I, th I think that the, your, your friends in Silicon Valley are right. Uh, and uh, I think it's Niles Ferguson. He used to be at Harvard. I think he's at Stanford now. He's a, a conservative historian. And, and uh, yeah, he's of the persuasion that um, the benefits of unrestrained uh, pursuit of unregulated capital outweigh the harm. And, and I can't remember what his book is called. It may be The History of Money or something. Yes. And it's a great book. And he just says, yeah. Uh, and I, I, it's a great book for me because it's honest. He's like, let me just <laughs> let. No, he is. He's here. I'm going to describe the 13. I'm, I'm making these numbers up. But he's like, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, the economy since the 1700s. Here's the 13 depressions that obliterated half of a generation, <laughs> and, and so on. And 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 again, he's honest. He's like, it would take a lot longer uh, to, to get grow. Google and yeah. Amazon uh, uh, if we wanted to avoid the occasional Great Depression of the 20th century. To which I reply. I'll wait. So again, this is <laughs> uh, uh, people of goodwill yeah. could disagree here. You know, uh, for yeah. any standard of quality of life that actually matters, it is the social democracies that make a mockery uh, out of the rest of the countries. So, it, and this is another, you know, argument that we can have respectfully. Um, you know, uh, if you're just counting shackles, uh, yeah, th then we've got the most. Uh, but if you go to the United Nations, for example, I can't remember what they call it, where they have, well, what are the standards that define a good life? You know, money's part of it, you know, but so is literacy and health care uh, and, um, uh, you know, rate of psychological disorders and so on. Uh, and yeah, I, I, and so again, here's one of these people of goodwill could disagree, but I would aim for the sweet spot uh, that, uh, that, that allows for maximal creativity in little micro unregulated markets, but under the, uh, under the superordinate rubric uh, of a government committed uh, to uh, uh, principles above and beyond what most American conservatives are willing to concede, which is that government is just here uh, to protect private property. Uh, that's a John Locke view that lots of libertarians uh, are, are big on. 
Uh, of course, when I say to them, then don't ride on the roads or go to a hospital, they don't care for that. So the libertarians that I'm familiar with, uh, they're all for individual freedom, uh, but they're, they don't have a way to describe how we could organize ourselves as a society. That's not fair because there's some uh, who do. I, I just, uh, I feel uh, myself that, um, that most, and, uh, and it's not just me, I'm going back to Plato in the Crito, you know, who just points out uh, that none of us are here by virtue of our individual talents or attributes. You know, we enter a world made possible by social organization, uh, usually through some form uh, of government. You know, the way uh, Socrates described it um, in the Crito is, it, you know, you came into the world, you didn't build the roads, the state did. You didn't build the schools, the state did. You didn't get the army to repel the invaders, the state did. Uh, and so, um, I prefer, even though it might seem quaint and antiquated, uh, the view that as social animals, we have an obligation to the preservation of the social structure that rendered it, us possible uh, to exist in the first place. Uh, moreover, uh, I feel like um, that, that people are better off um, when they live in a society uh, where things uh, like health care are, are uh, viewed uh, as, um, as basic rights uh, rather than commercial commodities. But even there, Tiger, what I would point out is that things like universal health care and a guaranteed income, they were originally conservative ideas. Like there's the liberal reason why you should have it, and that's because it's the right thing to do. But that's not why they were proposed. I, I think uh, that uh, uh, insurance for everybody was a German idea. And, and it was like, you know, sick people dying in the street is bad for business. Same thing for a basic income. It was a conservative idea. Give everybody a, a pocket full of money and that's going to keep the wheels of commerce going. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm degenerating a bit in terms of blubbering. But no, you're, uh, not. you're not. I think <laughs> I, I I, I think there's a way to have it both ways, as maybe uh, odd as it sounds. I, 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 so my hippie friends uh, who are always, you know, everything's got to be free and everybody gets everything. I'm like, well, you're not going to like, you know, you can you're not going to like what I have to say, uh, because I, I think that market based economies uh, when they operate as they're intended to in principle, I think they do produce invariably the best outcomes. And, and I think that, uh, you know, the trick is that, like I say, that we, even if I don't know how to do it, uh, just that, uh, that, that just balance between uh, a government that can provide uh, for what we need to thrive in this millennium um, uh, along with the capacity for endless innovation. Oh, Professor Solomon, we, we've just covered so much ground today. I, I, I know we don't have too much time left, but uh, I guess to quickly recap what you were saying, would, do you think it would be fair for me to say that a lot of your, you don't agree with a lot of the voices that are dominant in today's cultural or policy or political discourse like Peter Jordan Peterson or Stephen Pink like you don't you disagree with them not on a moral level but on a, on a sort of worldview level um, yeah I do and again with all with all due respect I, I think that uh, they are um, proponents of the view that was started by John Locke that there's uh, autonomous individuals there's no societies in a state of nature and, and that we reluctantly uh, form society uh, in order to get the security to accumulate property. Locke then goes on and says, you're entitled to as much property as you can accumulate. With the invention of money, you can have infinite amounts of stuff. And then Locke goes on to say uh, that because people vary in industry, uh, which means some of us are smarter, some of us are less lazy, uh, that inequality is not only natural and necessary, but it's good for everybody. 
uh, because that that's how we get the occasional Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, and they 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 do what they do, and and everybody's better off uh, as a result. Uh, and basically, all conservative um, economic and um, political philosophy is derivative of that idea. Uh, and you know, I give John Locke great credit because he did that in order to give us to get us to provide a philosophical justification for individual rights. I think that's great. But the cost of that idea has been equally great uh, because the notion that we're autonomous individuals um, is one of the, the most obviously wrong ideas in the history of Earth. There was never a time when human beings uh, were autonomous individuals who existed outside of society. The lemur is the last primate uh, that was an autonomous individual 60 million years ago. And, and my point is that if, and part of the justification uh, for embracing that kind of economic system it is the argument that people are fundamentally selfish. And so why don't we just indulge uh, that selfish proclivity? That was Adam Smith also. We're all selfish. Uh, so let's uh, pursue our self-interest and we'll all be better off as a result. To which I reply, uh, yes, we are selfish, but we're also, as Adam Smith noted, we have sympathy for our fellow humans and, and we are pro-social creatures who under optimal conditions are selfish at some times and extraordinarily generous at other times. And, and so, if I could be in the room today with, with Steven Pinker or Jordan Peterson, uh, I would ask uh, what, uh, what they're thinking in light of the more contemporary view uh, of the human animal, uh, as I said earlier, uh, as an uber social, hyper cooperative and collaborative entity that makes the cultural accumulation of knowledge over time possible. That, that's why uh, we're here. What makes us great is not the occasional greatness of isolated individuals. It's the genius of humanity to overcome our individuality uh, long enough to cooperate in the development of the, this culture that we pass over time. And every generation that gets it is able to add a little bit to it. It's almost like magic. Well, this is um this is very powerful professor solomon i i, I guess uh to, to quickly add on to that do you think humans are innately good or bad when they're born do, do, do you think about that question at, at all um because it feels like great philosophers like hobbes and rousseau have all taken up opposing sides on this question and so on yeah all right well that's one uh, i'll see you um with my nobel prize someday if I could ever answer that. With psychology, I, I think yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to try and have it both ways. I, I'm going to go with um, Ernest Becker in his last book, Escape from Evil, who, who just points out that Hobbes and Rousseau are both right and they're both wrong. In, in other words, uh, I like how Becker puts it at the end of Escape from Evil. He's like, conservatives are putting too much emphasis on Hobbes Liberals put too much emphasis uh, on Rousseau. And what you've got is either naive optimism or, or uh, unfortunate cynicism, rather than a more sober and evolutionarily accurate recognition, which is to say that we have the capacity for both good and evil which shifts the question somewhat in my mind to how can we create the conditions that maximize, as Lincoln would put it, to get our better angels to come out of us. That, yeah. that, that's perfectly put. And, and Professor Solomon, just as we gradually wrap up, I, uh, I guess we, we, you did mention John Gray. You also mentioned someone else that I forgot the name of. I guess what are the people that you would recommend our listeners to follow, to read? Well, I, I, I do like the British philosopher, John Gray. I've been uh, very much influenced by uh, of late. Um, I also, I, I didn't know that Jordan had another book. I'll, I'll take a peek at that. 
Um, I, I read all of um, Steven Pinker's books. I, to, to say that you disagree with folks, and this is another thing. This is, a, again, I think academics is degraded a bit because back in the old days, um, that's, it's, this is as it should be. There should be spirited disagreements and we need to have uh, more contact between folks. We become polarized in the academy just as well, where we rarely sit next to uh, folks that we might not already agree with. I can't think of anybody else though. I've been reading a lot of Shakespeare lately. Um, beyond that, no, nothing comes to mind, but I'm sure there's some good things. <laughs> but definitely oh, on the spectrum. I know. No, I've been reading. I've been trying to read, uh, besides Martin Heidegger, another philosopher who I've heard of, but have never gotten to is Emmanuel Levinas. I'm finding quite captivating. So I hope we get to talk again. Uh, you may not be at Princeton, but you're going to be doing something cool. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk again. about him. That would yeah. be great. I will, yeah. I will read about him. And also Ernest Becker, certainly. I mean, this yes. is this is obviously uh, uh, denial of death, escape, escape of from death, right? That, that's it's uh, escape that's, from evil. Is escape his from last evil. Book. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That that that's wonderful. Well, um, in in the tradition of our show, because the name of our show is Policy Punchline, I always wrap up at the end by asking our guest, "What would your punchline be?" So, Professor Solomon, what would your punchline be for today's conversation? Oh, I love that. So. Um, my punchline is from the gravestone of one of my favorite authors. So another, uh, in terms of suggestions, uh, uh, a guy named Sherwood Anderson, and he was an American novelist, and he wrote a book called Winesburg, Ohio, that I like quite a bit. And this is at the beginning, this over 100 years ago or so. And on his tombstone is written, life, not death, is the great adventure. And that's the punchline. Life, not death. So, yeah, so life, not death is the great adventure because we've just spent two hours and, <laughs> and I, I can't speak for you, but this has been just a joy and here yes. for me. And so here we are talking about the darkest aspects of human existence. We're talking about death and how it sometimes really turns us into unfortunate entities. But we need to remember why we're doing that it's it's not about death it's about life and so that's the punchline professor solomon i have to say this has just been absolute wonderful joy to talk to you and i, I still remember the first time i listened to your i mean i listened to your podcast in multiple sittings because very long with lex treatment it was three hours and uh especially when the middle of the part when you were talking about martin heidegger and kierkegaard i was uh uh, I was just finishing my 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 day that day. I was going on a walk in Washington D.C. in in the middle of the cold winter. I was just walking along the National Mall and pondering about what my next steps after Princeton would be. And it was such a struggle for me. But listening to those words, it, it was just uh, it really relieved me in in so many ways and opened up new ways of thinking. So I I really want to thank you at the end for for having this conversation with me today and and for inspiring me. And I imagine. Uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of other people beyond. Oh, well, th thank you, Tiger. It was great fun. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Absolutely. Well, well this concludes this episode of Policy Punchlines. Please uh, go buy Professor Solomon's book, The, the Warm at the Core, uh, on the role of death, death in life. And uh, you may follow us on policypunchline.com and watch this video on YouTube and listen to us on iTunes, Spotify, or any of the other podcasting platforms you may prefer. So thank you so much for listening today. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.